Welcome to the show. I'm James. I'm David. I'm Sarah. And I guess I'm Riley. And today we are discussing <laughs> your problems. We'll laugh. <laughs> we'll argue. We might get a little too into it. But at the end of the day, it's your life, buddy. It's a big episode, baby! Yes! Uh, spoiler alert. Uh, you get bad advice. <laughs> <laughs> I want to reduce the anxiety of whoever is listening and send something in and think that we're just going to laugh at them. We we're not. No. But we we already qualified. did that when we read your question no. before. Okay. <laughs> this is not financial advice or life advice. We are not lawyers. <laughs> they send in I'm questions to get advice and we tell them it's not. I mean, it's not. We're just giving our opinions. We're the show that someone named the big Lebrowski, Lebrowski? Sure. called a good podcast. Seriously, though. In their five-star review, which they entitled Riley Appreciation. <laughs> They're Australian, though, so I think that means they don't like you. Yeah, with opposite it's, it's day. opposite day. That's how it works. It flushes the other way. Next week, South Park, bigger, longer, and uncut. More formative comedies. We're doing it. Woo! Riley's a South Park hater. I can't wait. I'm not a hater. I just have never watched it. Mm -hmm. And but I don't you, but see you, a reason but you to. But you won't watch it. That's, well, no, I just... I hate this guy. I just don't. <laughs> James is triggered that I don't watch it. <laughs> but today, it's mailbag therapy episode all day. We got some good questions from some good people. But first, a mess from our sponsor, Vessi. Soggy sock season is upon us. That's a thing. Soggy socks, mm. uh, which means it's time to put those boat shoes back on the shelf, baby. And Vessi, they make sneakers with a waterproof material that offers you assurance when the weather report can. It whispers in your ear. It's called Dymatex, and it's going <laughs> to keep you warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Vessi shoes are comfy. They're breathable. They're lightweight. Plus, Vessi's giving away a free pair of socks for the first 100 people to use the code SOCKS, mm. TJM. SOCKS. SOCKS. So check out their early Black Friday sales with the link below. Socks, Socks, DGM. Yeah, Thanks to Secret Lab for sponsoring today's video, whether it's a, it's business or it's play. Secret Lab chairs are designed to keep you comfortable for long hours. I tried to make a noise with it, but it's just so it's dramatic. Giving people advice for Friday, for Black Friday, they're uh, currently offering up to three hundred dollars off select products. The Secret Lab Titan Evo twenty twenty two is shaped to support you while distributing weight evenly and leaving pressure from your butt. They come in a variety of upholstery, so there's a style and comfort to suit your needs plus they offer a five-year extended warranty and a 49-day return policy that's seven times seven so th uh, they have your back and your more, butt and more way than one <laughs> head to the link in the description and check out secret lab today secret lab hmm. thanks to brilliant for sponsoring this video brilliant is a hands-on interactive way to learn stem topics they offer thousands of lessons with new topics to learn each month, like their computer science fundamentals course. Hmm. Their services can be used to supplement a college education, or you can use it if getting smart is just a passion of yours. Not me. You, you weirdo. I like being dumb. Stay dumb, baby. <laughs> if you don't understand the basics behind a problem, where do you even start your troubleshooting? The first 200 people who head to brilliant.org slash TGM will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. It's better than using the Windows troubleshooter. Or asking us to I'm solve your problems for you. <laughs> Riley, give us the synopsis. Uh, well, there. One day there was there are people on the internet and they had life is complicated, and so at the end of the movie they all got the perfect solution from the. They're just movies podcast .com. Okay, who are we going with here? We we changed <laughs> that was all the real names. Rick and Morty style. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another thousand years answering questions. <laughs> um, we're gonna go. We're gonna start with Mr. Poopy Butthole. Uh, <laughs> speaking how, of Rick and Morty, how appropriate. That was already written down here. It was. Oh. That was their name. Please help me think through jumping back into the dating world after being a single dad for four years. I've been on a few dates, but dating is tough in the thirties. Always tough, to be honest, but it seems tougher. I guess the specific advice and thoughts I'd enjoy your take on is how to balance wanting to be a present dad and still find time to further my needs as well. Hmm. David, I would love your take as a person with a significant other who has kiddos. And James and Riley would love your thoughts as dads. Mm. And Sarah... I, I didn't write this, but Sarah would love your thoughts too. <laughs> That's a James parenthetical. That in there. I'm working through this in therapy and on my own, but would love your thoughts. Thanks, guys. Hope the episode goes great. Man. Well, it's happening now, is it? Ah. I mean, I, I feel like David is also a good person to start here because you have been in the dating world. Mm -hmm. I haven't been in the dating world since the apps. Arranged marriage. That's right. <laughs> we were together since we were 11, mm -hmm. and it was it was meant to be. 11th heaven. <laughs> um, but what's it, is it rough out there, David? It's it's different. How old were you when you were last in the last market? Last in the dating pool was last summer, so 30? Mm. 30, and it was, uh, it was interesting. It was very different. One thing I really appreciate about dating my 30s is you can be much more 
just like forward. You can mm. just say what you want, say what you're looking for, right. and people respond to that. It's not this game of like trying to be cool like it was in your 20s. And so I like the online dating scene. I think it's been really good for just like, you know, being like forward with exactly what you're looking for. You meet people that kind of have similar things. You chat with them a little Yo, bit. Yo, I'm not into unibrows. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, but you pluck that thing or get out. I found that I was able to figure out if I had good chemistry with people pretty good on the on the apps. I have I'm pretty comfortable texting and Do you try people. to get off the app ASAP? No. Like I, just like see if you have any kind of humor connection and then just get to a date to like really suss it out or do you spend time with the messaging? Both I, valid approaches. I with myself, I found myself generally trying to push for a date. It's like the easiest way to see if you're going to mesh with someone is to just meet in person, see if you have that chemistry. Because you can have like text chemistry, but you don't have in real life mm. chemistry. And that's different. Um, but I've also been on dates with people where the first date was awkward, but we had messaged well. And then we kind of like pushed through to a second date. And then all of a sudden it kind of clicked. Mm. Um, it's hard. There's no like turnkey solution to online dating. And I think having to balance your own kid with like dating is really hard. It's. Right, because you're coming in with someone as someone with no children, mm -hmm. and then you ended up dating somebody who has the age of this. They're 14 show? now. It's 14. Mm -hmm. So they were 13 when I started dating them. Right. It's a little bit of a different calculus when <laughs> yeah. you've got your own kids. <laughs> somebody could clip that. Yeah. yeah. We don't know how old Mr. Poopy Butthole's daughters are. We said four years, right? Oh, I guess well, he's been single. single dad for four years, so they're, you know, the youngest ones at least. Is it four, a daughter? Pre presumably. He's, yeah, daughters. All daughters, I think. I don't see it. But does that make a difference? Well, I've talked to this person for a while. Okay. All we right. We have a relationship oh, okay. on Twitter. You should open the Twitter. No, <laughs> I won't. Um, so we, and it, I'm assuming one zero context. We know he's in his thirties, but we don't know how deep into the thirties, but mm. it's a <sighs> Sarah, were I you on the dating apps at all? I was definitely, mm. but I think because I was on the dating apps right when I hit 18 and I was like, okay, let's, Whoa. let's have some fun. You know? <laughs> let's go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they didn't exist. I, I was on dial up. <laughs> Dial up. Yeah. There's 911 numbers. Yeah. Anyways, go ahead. Um, I what I was gonna ask is, do you think going into dating apps is the best way to start going back into the dating pool, or do you think looking at like singles events or mm. going to restaurants and stuff and like it's the lowest people. friction, so I think that it's it's so like you might as well try it. Yeah, because I feel like. It, I might recommend somebody go to like a dating event at some point, but it's like, why not just try the apps? I mean, it's like you're busy. This person's going to be busy, right? Like yeah. He's got a, probably has a full-time job and it's another full-time job when he has the kids. I think there's pro it's probably a, like a split custody situation. Mm -hmm. I man, think that this guy might you... actually have a ton of time when he doesn't. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Because <laughs> I mean, like, oh, oh sorry. No, go ahead. Okay. I was going to say, I personally just haven't had any luck with dating apps. Like I find... I guess the people my age are there for like pretty much one reason and that's not to be in a long-term relationship. Mm. So Well, it depends on what app probably. That, too. That's true too. But yeah. like, all the apps have, have, have it in common it. that the apps want they don't want to lose customers. Yeah. They're incentivized to keep you on the app. Right. So I feel like if you're ready to go back into the dating pool, I'm not sure if just jumping into dating apps is going to be the thing or just kind of waiting for something to happen naturally mm. the thing is though like the older you get the less and like the less you go out and stuff like that you really only have access to finite pools of people yeah. it's like right. who you work with friends of friends and like whatever hobbies you do no. as yeah. is basically it this guy's got all these kids those kids gotta have yeah. friends those friends gotta have moms of course <laughs> put your kids <laughs> in like soccer like, and start stuff start telling your kids to like go ask their parents if uh maybe maybe you wanna see somebody do you have a dad yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, like you were saying James I think that like I, you know obviously in person things are superior for getting a more complete picture of somebody quicker uh than like you know because someone can always put something on their profile and it seems uh, enticing and you maybe you, you have some chemistry and text and then you meet each other and you're just like, oh, no. So, like, that's, you know, meeting them in person, you're going to have to do that eventually. So, it's like, that's a better thing, but it's a lot of time. I mean, like, you're com committing probably a full evening or a day or whatever. And it whatever. can get expensive. Yeah, yeah, and, like, you know, if you can just pop open the app and, you know, and start. And you see a family photo and you're like, okay, they have kids. That's, yeah, a, yeah. that's definitely a pro tip. If you feel the pressure to spend a lot of money on that first date, it's not a good date. You want to go right. and like do something pretty casual, something that you feel comfortable doing. 
don't spend a bunch of money because there are people that are looking for free meals. Yeah. Uh, and so I think we, I was talking, I'm talking about these like singles events though, where they're mm-hmm. like, oh, you yeah. know, like maybe like uh, speed dating or whatever. Mm-hmm. Or there's a thing I think in uh, the lower mainland here called the, oh, Events and Adventures. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And you can just like sign up and go do like mm-hmm. fun activities with a bunch of single people. Mm-hmm. And that would be cool. I feel like you should probably, if you can, do the app and that kind of stuff in parallel. But. You know, again, this is me. I've I've been with my wife now for twelve years. Yeah, rub it in, big guy. I feel, so. like, I feel like something that gets lost in the dating discussion is we are constantly focusing on who you're looking for. But the key is like you want to be the person that you're looking for is looking for, and you mm-hmm. want to be ready for when you find someone that you want to date that you're dateable and you're ready to be dating. And so right. it's important to work on yourself first and like. I don't know where you're at with like your confidence and where like you're at with your your happiness and stuff, but that is essential. It doesn't matter how many dates you go on. If you're not happy and not necessarily physically attractive, but like personality wise attractive, it doesn't matter how many dates you go on. None of it will work out. You have to work on you and be ready for For that. For sure. For sure. We have several other questions that are about dating, but Uh let's get to the crux of Mr. Poopy Butthole's question, which is specifically about balancing right his needs with mm. trying to be a present dad because like he has this other element to it like let's say he does hit off somebody he needs to integrate this person into his life into his kids life so that's a greater risk right like mm. you don't want to bring people around that are only to be you know let's say it's date three and then you introduce it to the girls and then they don't make it past date five it's like you don't want to introduce this, these people to your kids that early and stuff right yeah, yeah. you kind of do but you kind of don't like you need to know that they get along. I can tell you the journey that I had to go through to make it work. So my, Cassie's kid uh, didn't want to meet me until like I took her on a date. Uh, and so she wanted me to like date Cassie for a bit and like make sure that things were working. And then I would take Zoe on a one on one date and like she would grill me and do this stuff. Mm-hmm. It didn't work like that. Wow. But um, I thought that that was kind of an interesting thing where it was like you do a couple dates like you can meet the kids or, or not. But then there's like a very intentional like if you're going to date or not, like there's more of a commitment early on, I think when they have kids, Mm, um, for sure. But I mean, you're basically signing on, not just to be a boyfriend, but a dad. Yeah. And that, that it was interesting because I didn't plan on dating someone with kids, but it, it's, I mean, it kind of happened and it, it, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's like a big enough answer. I almost want more context. Do you, do you feel like, do you feel like, uh, kind of connecting with, uh, Cassie and then finding that, there are kids involved. Did that? Were you like, oh, or were you well, like? I knew right away. Like it's in her profile or whatever. Right, right, right. But did that change the calculus for you? Were you kind of like, oh man, here we go? Or is it like, sure, it's no big deal? Uh, definitely changes the calculus. I like, I'd like to be like, oh, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change. But it's like for sure, that's a huge commitment. Yeah. To date someone that has a kid, because like I'm not her dad, but I am you know, a figure in her right. life that's of influence and of important. I take, help take care of her and pay for stuff. Right. For Mr. Poopy Butthole, though, he's pr- he's probably he's probably less so like that. He yeah. might expect to be creating a combined family where he's pr- he might find a partner who also has that's their totally own kids. Fair. And that's a whole other thing. Then you got to introduce the kids. Yeah. yeah. I think down to the root of things, uh, the best advice would be being just upfront immediately about wanting to find somebody who is respectful of you and your time with your kids. It's mm. clear that his greatest priority is his kids. Yeah, right. exactly. So just be honest about that. Be upfront because the yeah. more that you drag on a conversation with somebody and then bring it up, if you are talking to somebody who wants to be reliant on their significant other, obviously a relationship like that wouldn't work out. Mm. So yeah, just be upfront about it. Yeah, I would say continue to prioritize your kids, obviously, because uh, if you bring in someone and you're like, oh, this person might be perfect and uh, I have such good chemistry or whatever, but it's having a toll on my, on my relationship with my kids and my ability to be a dad, mm-hmm. Like, as a dad, I think that, like, you want to, like, it's it's not wise to take a risk on someone knowing that it, there's a good potential for you to, like, damage your relationship with your kids or, like, do, you know, take something away from them. Oh, and listen to your kids, man. Yeah. Listen yeah. to your kids. Because my, I had an awful stepfather for many years. And uh, we, there was warning signs day one. <laughs> and, right. like, me and my sister just, like, we were told my mom like you know we expressed ourselves and it didn't matter mm. and so that was just a betrayal right right and so you don't want to be set up like that yeah 
I, I mean, also, I think it's just important to ask the hard questions early on too. Like Cassie's last partner, like by the end of the relationship, was pretty open about not wanting to have Zoe in her life. Like yeah. she wished that like it was just you know the two adults and like didn't have to take care of them. And I think like there was the signs early on. Even Cassie knew it early on, but she, like you said, she, they kind of just deny it or you put it, you push it to the background and you don't think about or it. Or you so, think like, you can change people? Yeah. Don't don't plan on changing someone. Mm. If you have a bad feeling, like explore that. Go into it. Don't just push it to the background because it's a lot harder to stop dating someone six months, a year, two years in than it is to just yeah. stop dating them right and away. And it's also a lot harder. To, I don't want to say uh, like obviously getting into a relationship thinking that you're going to change somebody is always kind of like not a great idea. But the fact is that people get together young and then they change like you change throughout your 20s. And by the time you get into your 30s, you've kind of like solidified. So like. It's especially it's especially not a great idea to get into a relationship in your 30s thinking that, oh, they can change later. Like, they're probably not no, going no, to, no, no. and you're probably not going to, so so find somebody where it's like you are, yeah, both of your friends solidified personality work together. It sounds obvious, but you're, you really do have to resist the temptation because if you're really having a tough time out there and you finally meet someone who thinks like, okay, I can actually talk to this person, you're going to have this like sunk cost fallacy yeah. where you're like, well, maybe I can change them this way or they'll end up being that way. Right. And you're going to want to do that because you just went through all this bullshit, like on so many failed dates or just mm. people yeah. not responding to you or, you, you know, you're going to want to make you justify it. You cannot play the games that young people play of like, well, we're working through some stuff and maybe we can no. still change it. It's like when you're when you're at this point. You just kind of, you just be honest. When, when you have kids too that are in the yeah. mix, it's like you have to be honest exactly. with yourself and with them. I will give like a, I feel like some of the things we're saying sound kind of negative and I will give sort of an optimistic take here where I know multiple people who have uh, had relationships end at or after the 30 year old mark and they all were uh, really anxious about their ability to meet somebody again because everyone says, oh, dating your 30s is really hard. And like, oh, no, everyone, the clock's ticking and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, there is that anxiety there. But it, like all of the people that I know that were in that position uh, are currently, they found somebody and they are currently happy in a relationship. And I, you know, who knows if they'll last or whatever. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that um, don't be overwhelmed by the negativity and the anxiety of getting into that time in your life and being like, oh, I got no time left. No. There's time, there's people out there, uh, you know. And as shitty as it is, uh, it's a lot easier for a man in their 30s to date, I think, than it is for a woman in their 30s. For sure. Uh, is it? Well, I would I say would... maybe the opposite. Really? Well, because girls... Depends what you're after. Uh, yeah, I guess so. I, I would say that... Uh, this is sort of like a patriarchal thing where like men continue to be rated attractive, like into middle age. Mm -hmm. And as women approach middle age, their attractiveness decreases. Society. Not my wife. Statistically, <laughs> yeah. statistically, I'm not saying whatever. No, I'm not an outlier. That. Okay. Yeah, great. I'm Going just saying, the other way. I'm just saying, so that that's one thing anyways. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I haven't experienced dating in your 30s. So maybe I love you, Bay. Uh, okay. <laughs> I also love my wife. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, well, I don't know the, the numbers Yeah. about difficulty, but. I think the key is. It's different for everybody. Yeah. I feel like to find the balance, you have to decide for yourself how much time you want to spend with your kids and prioritize that and make sure you're not sacrificing that time. Like, like I know with Cassie, she would make sure that each week there's like mom daughter date mm. date night and it's right. like it doesn't matter if that's the only night we could hang out it's like we just wouldn't hang out and she would have that with her daughter yeah so you prioritize that make sure that you have the stuff that works for you and you invest into that relationship i know that's for myself good... i'm i'm always in danger of hyper fixating on you know the new project which would be like dating like oh yeah i right. find a mate whatever but then you kind of let everything else slide because you're not focused on that prioritize your kids. Can't let those mm. kids slide. Yeah, exactly. That's a great like concrete suggestion to end this one off. This mm. would be All like right. pick a day, have a daughter date night. Yep. That brings us to Kane. Do you want to read this one? <laughs> okay. My wife and I are very different types of people. We come from very different backgrounds, have very different interests, likes. You get the idea. On paper that seems like it wouldn't work. But in practice it's actually very refreshing. We've both expanded our hori horizons quite a bit, discovering new music, culture, and activities that we now love, uh, and may, may have never been exposed to otherwise. 
But the one thing that drives the biggest wedge between us is politics. Ah. That's a tough one. You can only avoid it coming up for so long. My solution was to do what anyone in my position would do. I edit the Wikipedia pages to make my opinions facts. <laughs> Sorry, what? Here's where the problem lies. No, sir, that is the problem. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> lately, they've been redacting my edits so quickly that they're gone before the argument even starts. It's your wife, actually. She knows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My best solution so far has been to write in my notes app what I want to add to the Wikipedia. Copy it to my clipboard so I can quickly edit and paste it uh, in right before I start the argument. Hoping you tech guys have a better solution. Dude, Wikipedia. this is not the way. No. Okay, but like is this, is this guy joking? This I feel like joke, it's a joke. Yeah. I, I don't... I think... No, it's gotta I think be it's joke. real. This it's is real. It's gotta be a joke. We have to treat it like it's a real situation. If you put okay. as much energy into being an open-minded listener as you do into trying to make it like create a rally distortion field uh, i think your relationship would be healthier certainly yeah. yes the, the, i just okay. you clearly don't have sound arguments what yeah if you have to make up facts then maybe you need to examine what your beliefs are <laughs> i i i have to okay i have to believe this is a joke but let's okay I my gut to, says it's a joke can too, really you saying like, that is very scathing what if it's not a joke i'm like 80 percent of the way i would i would bet money that this is a joke but Audience, let's pretend that it's not us. a joke no 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 let's pretend that it's not a joke and you actually think that it's a solid solution to <laughs> to to edit wikipedia so that you can prove to your wife that you're right even though you know that you're wrong uh because <laughs> you're manipulating facts that's a horrible thing to do and you shouldn't do it so i'm not going to give you advice yeah. about how well, to make that better it just goes to show that your arguments aren't as examined as you might think they are you to me, it says I don't actually have when it get, you know, when you think you have like an airtight yeah. belief and then you get an argument with someone and you're like, damn it, they're kind of winning. I don't have an answer for these things. I know in my heart that they're wrong, but I don't have answers ready. Um, yeah, you just don't, your answers aren't good, man. You need to examine and, and, well, be, and yeah. be open. You might, maybe you're too tribal and you need to be open to yeah. actually uh, hearing the other side. Well, yeah. That said, oh, no, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say Wikipedia aside, uh, considering everything the umbrella of all of the wonderful things that have come uh because of your relationship you need to look at the factor uh that is not ruining it but like you know bringing it down bringing the mood down and um like figure out the best way for you and your wife to communicate that uh this is a problem uh, and then, yeah, just go from there, like be honest with each other. If this is really something that's putting a knife in your relationship, you have to talk about it. And if you don't talk about it, it's just going to continue to get worse. Yeah. Maybe we should, maybe we should address the, uh, the common issue of like political disagreements in relationships. Yeah, I think that's it. I think the a healthy thing to do is to find common ground. Sometimes mm -hmm. we can get yeah. so in the weeds yeah. with an argument. It really feels like we're arguing, like if you believe X, you're evil. And if you believe why you're virtuous mm -hmm. uh, and that these two things are just so miles and miles apart. But a lot of the time we're actually just arguing kind of minutia. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like, hey, we're all on the same team. We all want every per every person, to, every child to be fed and every person to be happy. Right. We just disagree about the best way to allocate funds to do that. Yes. You know, like opening up with that kind of common ground is. This is a we, yeah, we're, we're talking to so that's a good vibe. We're talking to individuals in relationships and we're also talking to the entire uh, population of the well, of the earth right now where oh, sorry, you have to especially when like it comes to uh, divides in populations that have to live together or people that have to live together. It's super super important to remember this that at the end of the day you want very similar things. You're talking about methods mm -hmm. and uh you know, that could be extrapolated to like the political landscape in general. But go ahead, David. Yeah, I think that it's important to get off online because everything is so politicized and it needs to be simplified because, you know, we consume headlines and we consume tweets. We don't consume mm. information. And I think that if you take a break from this, the things that are radicalizing you both to whatever side right. and you like, like you said, you find the common ground and work together to discuss. <clears throat> I think that's a lot healthier than yeah. And like in arguments in general, when you're discussing with your partner, you're not trying to be right. You're trying to work through it. Right. Like it's like not just political discussion. Like when you're in a fight or whatever, don't try and win the fight. Yes. Yeah. No. I mean, this is smarter at the end. This yeah. is like number one relationship advice is 
don't try to win fights. Try to gain understanding. Yes. And, and, and you don't even really have to come to like an agreement per se, as long as you end it by saying to each other, I understand where you're coming from. And that's yeah, it. Especially if it just doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Like I remember, um, like being politics a, being a pretty, <laughs> it's a joke. I'm a, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a pro choice person. I'm not a, a forced birther, but my wife, nice. I remember when I first met her, uh, and this actually speaks to the, your description here. I, there's things I used to think that like a checklist of things I thought I needed in a partner. And then I met my now wife and I was like, wow, you don't check a lot of these boxes. But turns out it doesn't matter. Uh, like, well, yeah, the check boxes, the checklists are uh, I go, I, I, never a great my idea. My ideal partner would be like an artist or something. It's like, yeah, yeah, no, it yeah. doesn't matter. You can have friends who are artists right. and your partner can be an accountant. It doesn't yes. matter. Um, but she was, uh, she's not strictly pro-life, but she's more pro-life than me. And I thought that like, you know, I could never be with someone like that. Uh, turns out, well, didn't matter in our relationship. We had our kids and now I have a sect me. So <laughs> who fucking cares? Why argue about it? Because it's yeah. not even applicable to your own life. Like, well, for an example. I mean, I think that like, you know, most political disagreements there at the end of it, you're not going to like enact policy. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, it's it's it, they, they all are like theoretical and abstract to a certain degree. But I think that uh, it's super, super important to. Uh, uh, steel man the other person's case. So like straw man would be like setting up a crappy version of their argument and attacking it. Steel man would be setting up a strong version of their argument and actually considering it, you know? Yeah. So I think that this is super important for you when you're in your relationship with someone else and you're having a political disagreement or a disagreement about, about everything. Don't try to win. Yep. Try to understand. Try to help them understand your position and, uh, or just lie and say that you do agree with them because they don't know what you're voting for anyway. <laughs> yeah, or edit Wikipedia. Well, and I think, and we're kind of giving high level advice of like, if you're in control of your emotions, sure. how you do it. I think a big Super thing hard. is always be, <clears throat> always ask for space if you need it. If you're like getting upset and you know that you're going to like attack or you're going to like lash out, it's really important just to like, I am really upset. I'm really Triggered, whatever. Or I feel myself I getting feel myself worked get, up. I really would like to continue to this discussion because I know it's important to you, but I'd like to just like, you know, take take a little bit of time, go for a walk, right. go for a drive, whatever. And that's a huge key to success for me. Yeah. You got to recognize like, your own yeah, patterns. Totally. You I, also have to recognize that men and women have different half lives so or how long it takes to calm down on stuff. This <laughs> is like, a, this is a scientific fact. Speaking, like, well, just say speaking very generally. Yeah, sure. Just there's like there's a radio on, lab uh, ab, podcast average, where you can listen yeah. to. Yeah, it's not a matter of changing the other person's mind or beliefs or ideals. It's about explaining why you believe in what you believe in, and if the other person disagrees, then you come to that and right. <laughs> don't bring it up again. Mm. Like, or just break long, up and date someone who okay. thinks like yeah, you do. As long as it's not hurting anybody and it's a healthy conversation, mm. then like let it happen. I will say, as someone who had like this extremely unemotional, logical approach to disagreements like this uh, when I was younger. This is something that I've learned to do in adulthood. Uh, not only the fact that like I have to give someone space to to like work through their emotions. Uh, you know, if they are if they are like feeling intense in a situation and they like need a second, I'm like, okay, I've learned to like give that space. Mm -hmm. And I also need to like I also had to learn because I this wasn't this didn't come naturally to me. I also had to learn that I sometimes need to, you know, bug out of the conversation for a yeah. second and just like collect myself. Yeah. And it's super easy to forget that both parties that's important for both parties to realize. For sure. Uh, I I find like you can you can find yourself feeling the escalation like your voice raises and you do this. And like yeah. for me a big very practical tip is just repeat what they said back to them more calmly than they said it to you. Like Whatever they said, like give it back to them in like however many words, right? And like use that as a chance to really listen and understand. Like you said, steel man their argument, yes. and just like take a second. Yeah. You've heard of breakup sex, but what about political fight sex? <laughs> it, you don't even have to break up; you get all the benefits. Hell yeah! This could be a thing. All right, let's move on to easy problem guy. <laughs> Red wave. Red wave. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes! <laughs> Oof. Oof. I have a horrible memory and forget things slash get disinterested in things very quickly without meaning to. There's a girl at work I found pretty cute, so I talked to her a bit and found out she was pretty into COD, and I played it. I also played that with my friends. She played it. She plays COD. Yeah, yeah she plays COD, and you also play it with yeah. your friends, so you invited her to play. Unfortunately, she had to take her grandma to an appointment that day, so it didn't work out. 
I was disappointed, but understanding of the situation. So I let it pass because I'm not a psycho. James, <laughs> James added that. Uh, but then I completely forgot about her until I saw her again later that week at work. I feel like I should just let it go since I already forgot about her, but I don't want her to forget about her because she did seem very cute and more my type and I don't want to possibly lose out on something. What should I do? So do I understand this right? It's like you invited somebody to like a virtual date. Uh, they had to bail. Cool. But then you didn't follow up and now you're like, damn, I didn't follow up. And you're asking, should I never talk to her again? <laughs> no. Or what should I do? And to me, the reason I'm calling you easy problem guy is because <laughs> you just obviously talk to her again. Uh, and I think, honestly, the fact that you forgot about her is working in your favor because everybody knows people, especially young people, want what they can't have. Mm. So by you not talking to her for days and days, you look awesome. And she's going to want you so bad. So what you do is you go and talk to her again. And But instead of you focusing on... Depends. Yeah, it depends. Everyone's going to have their own take. This is my take. <laughs> okay. I'll give mine you, after. You go and talk to her again and you, instead of framing it as, oh, I'm so sorry I didn't get back to you, you frame it as how a caring person's mind would work. I'm so sorry I didn't follow up and see if your grandma's okay. Ooh. That's good. See? Done this before. Social and, manipulation uh, tactics. Uh, I'm a caring person. This is how I think. Oh, okay. Um, That's right. But yeah, man. You, uh, or person. You just talk to them again. It's like not a big deal. Well, I think don't put so much pressure on yourself to, you know, if it's like to talk to them, it has to be, you know, leading towards dating. Just like talk to them like a friend. Yeah. Like talk to them about COD. Talk about your like favorite loadout and be like compare what you do in Warzone. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. Like, that's something I did when I was in high school was like, I was like, oh, I like this girl. I've got to be like cool and different. And it's like, there's these all the, my friends that are girls that I just was myself with. And like, don't split it. Just be yourself and yeah. chill and I think don't that, put pressure on yourself. I think that I remember really thinking that, well, uh, you know, it's like a big deal to, to, to label what is happening. Like you can't just, it's really, it's hard when you're a young person to, uh, just have that interaction and have that normal interaction without like labeling it. You're totally. like, what is this? Are we are we flirting right now, or are we just not going to flirt because we're there's no romantic attachment at all? Like, you don't feel the need so to label it as much. I mean, obviously you have the goal, and like I think James' uh, advice to like ask about the grandmother is a great uh, a piece of advice because you if you come in being like. So we never had that date. Should we have the date? No. You know, it like it can come come, come off strong. Well, it's like what she was trying to take care of the grandma, right? Um, I think it's very important not to label it because you don't know what she's thinking in this instance. She could be like, "Oh, this guy's inviting me to play COD." Uh, the whole grandma situation. I just want to say, from like my point of view, something Fake, that super I've made done up. a lot. <laughs> yeah. Is, okay, I was going to bring this up. Coming up with excuses not to mm -hmm. play because you're just not interested. Mm. Maybe you have your group of friends that you love playing COD with, and you just don't care to play with another person um, or you're just not interested in this guy and you don't want to get into a work relationship mm -hmm. right because that's another thing to consider is dating somebody in your workplace can put a lot of different like risks mm -hmm. um, so that's something to consider uh, aside from that yeah just talk to her again be like hey I'm so sorry we didn't have a chance to play like I hope your grandma's okay like you said if you're interested again let me know when you're free maybe mm. uh, help kind of engage more conversation from her as well and get an idea from her as to how she's feeling uh, and then yeah go from there and just generally and this is kind of part of what both of you guys have said uh, you might want to switch your mentality I don't know how your mentality is now but it, th this is a good way to look at it going forward um, a lot of dudes tend to think about getting put into the friend zone, but really you start in the friend zone. Mm. Like women are thinking of everybody's starting in the friend zone. I mean, if you're lucky, <laughs> Not the you're that zone. or you're the danger yeah. like get the hell right, away from yeah, me zone. Yeah, yeah. And then you emerge out into the other plane of more yeah. than a friend zone. Yeah. You, don't, you don't like start there and then lose that. So um, she probably... Yeah, I mean, it's possible just, to just get, talk to like she's your but friend. Also, it's possible to get stuck in the friend zone, yeah. but don't that's think that that's you're remaining. What? Okay. Yeah, yeah, you, 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 but don't think that you're like, you've been downgraded into the friend zone by default. Yeah. No, but, just yeah. continue talking about yeah. common interests and uh, see how it goes from there. What were you gonna All say, right. Dave? No, that's fine. Oh, oh. We're, we're through this one. All right. I'm sure we'll kind of have similar talking points. The last the thing episodes. I wanted to say about that one, though, is just that, especially when you're young, uh, there's there can be this like frantic need to like date people 
and like, oh, I need to, I need to hook up and I need to blah, blah, blah. It's just like, it's so, your life is going to be so much better yeah. if you just chill. I if you just take it easy. Like, if you meet someone and they're cool and you end up hanging out, cool. But don't feel the need to be like, oh, I need to, I need to sign the deal. One easy of the, for you to say. You've had sex before. <laughs> I, I'm just I saying. was going to say, one of the most cringe, you know when you look back on memories of your life and you're like, why the fuck was I doing that? Was My entire college experience. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it was grade 12 for me and I remember I, one day maybe I maybe it would build up for a while I was just like I don't want to end high school single I mm. want to have a girlfriend by then at high school right. and I just like talked to every girl and I was like trying to <laughs> suss it out and do it and I like looking will back will you date me? will you date it, me? I never like was quite that bad I right. think I was that bad in grade 8 but Sh sure um, it's not good it's not a good look to be desperate it's mm. not a good look to be like rushing into anything it's like focus on you Make yourself the best version of yourself you can be. Yeah. And you are going to find someone. Like, how good at COD are you? You maybe should just wait till you're just like really clicking heads. <laughs> yeah, 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 or yeah. maybe she is not that great yet. <laughs> oh, and she doesn't feel comfortable playing with somebody else. You do not want to date somebody who hasn't <laughs> prestiged a number of times. Yeah, so bring down your skill base. <laughs> is that even a thing anymore in, in no modern idea. COD? No, no, well, prestige is a thing. Mr. Wayans. I don't know. That's not your ranking. Mr. Wayans, sometimes life is just super overwhelming and can feel extremely stressful. I find it hard to really bring balance to the force between <laughs> the joy in life and stress that brings me down sometimes, and I just don't know what to do. How can I better manage that stress? Hmm. Welcome to being a human. <laughs> I would say yeah. have something in your life that is routine and reliable, mm. that is like a steady anchor. Um, between the ups and downs that we all inevitably have. If there's something, you know, I can always go for a run and that'll level me out or like, I don't know, play a, a game pet or something, something like that, a hobby. Like I know that I have rock climbing on Tuesday nights and that's always good. Something reliable that is just, that can I, help you weather these things. I think a big thing is really taking a harder look at what you're spending your time doing and looking at what really fills your cup. Mm. I think it's really easy to get occupied with the stuff that gives you the instant gratification. Like for me, it's video games or social media or whatever. And, but that stuff doesn't fill my cup. Mm. And I don't, if I stayed home all weekend playing video games and eating food, I wouldn't be more happy at the end of the weekend. Yes. I would be placated and I would be like, wow, I had a great relaxing weekend. But like when I examine that's not the stuff that fills me up. Like sitting down and writing, going for a walk, doing this. Like those are the things that like spiritually my being is filled. Right. And I think that's really important to slow down, stop doing the stuff that's just fun. And like, like you said, find the hobby, find the thing that makes you feel whole or mm. not whole, but bigger. Or a mm -hmm. sense of accomplishment. Yeah. Mm. But for a real one, not the video game one <laughs> <laughs> yeah achievements don't count yeah. i feel like i don't have anything to say for this because i still have not figured out the mm. best way to manage my time hobbies and my stress mm. <laughs> i saw an interesting clip from um huberman's podcast do you know this guy no this is his first name i forget but a uh, huberman lab podcast is awesome and he has one on dopamine and he was, he was telling people like when you you can really mess up your system if you get dopamine spikes that are too huge like mm. going to a restaurant is already like a sweet dopamine hit but doing that and then like having your phone which oh. at the same time and having all your friends there so, and then yeah you just like compo like compound all these different dopamine spikes onto one and it kind of messes up your huh. system yeah that's really interesting so you should just like just separate them out yeah and right. like just be at the restaurant with your friends and like yeah don't have your phone out don't as be well. afraid to like do just one thing um, mm -hmm. the main thing that I was going to say <laughs> about this uh, situation is in, in regards to stress, I think what you said, James, is a really important, like finding something that can kind of like bring you down to baseline again. Mm -hmm. But I think that if you find yourself getting up into this like stressful, panicky state all the time, it can be really helpful to kind of just like identify the specific thing that is like the biggest contributor to the stress. I've been in situations where because of work and personal situations with friends and family and, you know, uh, trying to deal with like house stuff, it's like everything just seems like it's piling up and you, it's super easy to kind of just like go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing because you feel like every single thing is so urgent and you can't like take a second. But if you can manage to, t to take a second and really look at all your tasks, I mean... You know, I have ADHD, so it's super easy to, like, be overwhelmed by everything. 
writing things down in a list and checking them off and being like, okay, once I do that, I'll feel a little bit better. And once I do that, I'll feel a little bit better. And as you kind of like compartmentalize and realize all of the different components that can, that's contributing to the state you're in right now, uh, can really, really help you to totally. like chip away at that, at feeling of stress and get to a point where there's less going on and you have a bit more mental bandwidth because if you are just trying to tread water, like carrying a million things, yeah. you're just going to sink. I totally. need to try that. <laughs> I need to do that at work more. Sometimes there's like so many things going on in the morning and I just get like buzzed. And I'm just yeah. Like, ah. yeah. Yeah. I so totally agree. Sometimes you put it to paper. You're like, okay, it's not a million things. I've, it's I've, five yeah. things. The one, sometimes it feels like even when you put it to paper, it's impossible to do. So just like start with the thing that you feel capable to do. And yeah. then like the dopamine hit of that will give you a little more capacity to do the next thing. And then, yeah. and even if like that day you can only do two of the 10 things on your list, yeah. the next day you're going to wake up and you're, you're going to have like worked out that, that brain muscle a little bit and then you'll have a little more right. capacity and just but keep even, chipping away. But even in a situation where it's hard to tell what exactly is causing the stress? Like, obviously, you're going to be super stressed if you have a million work things to do. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, no, I haven't vacuumed the house in a million days. And blah, blah, blah. Like, even in a situation where that's not the case and you're just, like, super stressed all the time and you're not really sure why, if you can kind of, like, think through all the elements in your life about, like, hey, what has changed? What's different? Like, in for me personally, I went through a huge, crazy... Uh, I've never experienced, like, anything close to depression before, I think, in my life until the pandemic hit and all my friends, not all my friends, but a significant chunk of my friends kind of like differed from me very in, uh, uh, in significantly when it came to like political stuff. Obviously everyone was dealing with stuff at that time, but but I think I was like, okay, wait, if I address, I think that's the main thing that's changed. And I tried kind of like addressing different things. I tried getting more sleep. I tried like doing things. If you kind of try switching things up and uh, you might be able to identify something that has changed recently that has caused the stress or the depression or whatever, you know? Not, I don't want to say clinical depression, like yeah. fixed depression. I'm just saying, like, if you find yourself in an altered mental state, uh, there's probably some kind of, like, root thing that triggered that. And I think it's a good time to remind people that the advice we're giving is, like, the same advice that a friend would give you. Right. If you're really dealing with stuff that you're finding overwhelming, it's important to get help. And, like, talk to a professional who will actually be able to navigate these issues but also be able to hear much more about the context and give you specific tools and advice. Cause we're just giving general advice yeah. and stuff that's worked for us. For but sure. like we are, we're just, we're just people pro therapy. They're just get rid of the stigma. Th yep. See somebody, talk to somebody. Everyone needs therapy. Yeah. yeah. Everyone needs therapy. Truly. Yeah. It's the best. Mm -hmm. Everyone should do it. But if you can't afford that, try doing uh, regular exercise, no. uh, sauna section sessions and dietary fiber. Get very far. What with was the those. second one? Sonos? Sauna, bro. Oh, sauna. Sauna is very good for you. <laughs> so, well, I sweat. I'm a sweaty boy. So I, I love those. But Check out the I sauna. think a lot of my feelings of depression in the past have been like a sense of loss of control. And so, like, I know that, you know, working out is like the big eye roll, like, oh, you're depressed. You should work out. For me, no, but it it's, really fucking helps. Yeah. And it's it's like, just hard to get your ass off the couch and do the first few so times. 100%. But it's like, do the thing that you are able to do. And then use the like momentum from that to like get the ball rolling. Yeah, it's, it's so fucking hard to get started. And, like I can totally attest when you're stuck in it, it's impossible. It feels impossible. I know that we don't. Uh, no one says his name anymore, but that's actually the Jordan Peterson thing. <laughs> the, the small. That's his whole like clean your room thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. the smallest locus of control you have is like what you can't. You can make your bed. Yep. Right. That's a very small thing. You have control over that. You yep. make your bed one day. The next day you can make your bed and pick up the clothes off the yep. floor. Yeah. You do all that, then you can get your ass at the gym, and then right. so on and so on and yep. so on. I believe I believe in that. We'll call it the Jordan Peelerson. <laughs> ah, I like it. It's, yeah. that, it's scary. There's someone in your bathroom who can you at any time. <laughs> We're just getting like real general now. Let's get specific. What is the thing? What is the next one? Phil writes. Phil? Well, fuck. So I just got <laughs> home from a weekend away f for work, and this morning my wife says she isn't attracted to me anymore and wants to get separated. We've been married for almost three years, together for eight years, no kids, two dogs. I still love her and we're best friends, but she isn't happy and wants to find someone she's more attracted to, I guess. So the question is, do I push for couples therapy first or do we just separate? We talked about the same issue earlier this year and I thought things were getting better, more romantic <laughs> dates, but now out of the blue, she wants to be done. Any advice? I think if you work well as friends, you need to just end it. I know that's like the, <sighs> the worst thing thing to think about but at the end of the day if she's not happy trying to force yourselves to work isn't going to help like if there's little things that bug her or if there's little things that bug you in the relationship 
trying to change the person to conform to what you want them to be and vice versa it's not going to work in the end oh. mm. I, my my uh knee jerk is the opposite and it comes from my i once asked my late grandmother what if she had any regrets in her life she was like she died pretty early so she's only in her 60s when she answered this question but she said i wish i had tried she was like my step grandma i guess uh, she said i wish i had tried harder in my first marriage mm-hmm. um and so i took that to heart and then when my i have a close friend who was married for three years and then they separated and i remember when they were going through that being like yeah you guys should do couples therapy you should you know you shouldn't you can't just like be in a slump you should explore all options to try to work through this because you know i've seen you guys together you're both wonderful people you've loved each other you've gotten this far in life like maybe you're just talking past each other or something Uh, i think working on stuff is viable at the same time i'm not I think if people like break up, break up and get back together and break up and just like yeah. freaking end it, you guys are not meant to oh, be together. For sure. like, get the yeah. hell out of there. But I think that I think it is worthwhile to to put some work into trying to to make a relationship that's been a long term relationship to make it work. I totally agree, and I think I think if if it was like year two of a relationship, you'd be like, no. If you're already like feeling these feelings of like not being attracted to each other or like her not being attracted to you, that maybe it's not right. But when you're Three years into a marriage, you've made vows, and I think it's worth putting in the work. Mm. Uh, well, they've been together for eight yes. years. Yeah. Uh, and I think that I remember one of the cheesy, you, you know, you go to like church conferences or whatever, <laughs> you get cheesy lines that, that stick with you. And it was like the one that is coming to mind is uh, love isn't a feeling, it's a choice. Mm. And I think that that's an important yep. lesson is that it's not like you're always going to feel excited and love and attractiveness. It's like at one point you've decided to commit to each other. And it's important to work on that. And I know you're the person that is in danger of being left. So it's not quite the right thing. But I think it's right. important to not just give up and to fight for it at least a little bit. And maybe maybe a therapist will tell you otherwise, although a therapist will never tell you to break up. That's very right. rare. Yeah. Um, but I think it's also important. It's always important to work on yourself. Mm. It's like you can always look at your relationship problems and like, you are at least half of them. <laughs> You're at least half the problem. Yeah. yeah. Let me drop I, some more context. Oh. You ready? Yeah. This person's 29. Okay. So they've been together almost 11 years. So that brings you back to like high school. <clears throat> um, almost 11 years. Oh, they've eight. been married for three years and then together before that for eight oh, years? Oh, sorry. It just says together for eight. My yeah. bad. So oh, eight so years. So okay, you're 21. Yeah. You're 21. You got together. So yeah. a lot of tr- changes. That is pretty young. Uh, yeah. I mean, honestly, I was going to say basically the same thing as you guys just said. And the only thing that made me think like, I don't know if like trying to fix this is going to work out is the fact that this came up. He said this came up or they said uh, earlier this year and like they he tried to change things and then it didn't. So it's too late. Well, I'm not going to say it's too late, but I'm just saying that what you were saying, you know, when people like break up and get back together and break up and get back together at that point, it's kind of like, I mean, that is how people get stuck in relationships and then resentment grows and then like when they should have just gotten out. So I'm not saying like get out. I think like obviously I agree with the sentiment that especially once you're married and you are like with this person for this long and you have both decided to be in a long-term relationship, 100% uh, at that point, love is a, it should be a choice and not a feeling. Like you can't depend on your everyday feelings like, oh, today I just... Like, it seems like recently I just, like, don't love you as much as I used to. I guess we should break up. Like, that's not how long-term and relationships and marriages work. Like, the the way that they work is by choosing someone. Mm-hmm. And, but at the same time, you have to have these, like, conversations about, like, okay, is this smart to keep choosing each other if it keeps, like, getting to this point? So, sure. I would say do couples therapy. Ask her if she wants to do couples therapy. If she's unwilling to, like, what are you going to yeah, do? Is, at, at the end of the day... The wife says that she wants to get separated and nothing that you can do is going to like stop her from separating with you if she really wants to. So, you know, suggest that for sure. Do your due diligence and try to make it work uh, because that's what you have to do. But and it's not going to be if it doesn't work out, it's not the end of the world. You will find happiness. Exactly. Totally. Maybe I'm a pessimist, but the way that it sounds in the message is the wife is over it. And I think if somebody 
comes to that in their brain and feel like they're already ready to move on there's really no hard. point in trying to force it well yeah. guess what this message came in on a tuesday and i didn't tell you this but i got a follow-up on the friday she moved into the guest bedroom and they're going to start the paperwork they decided to skip the the therapy because she's pretty sure okay. and yeah. this yep. is the second time that she has broken up with him so okay. uh Oh, actually, what he says is this is the second time she's broken up with me out of nowhere, so I just can't trust her anymore, which is another element to it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, okay, well, with, with that additional context, uh, yeah, it seems like this is for the best, obviously, because you, you can't keep people in relationships that they don't want to be in. 100%. Um, I think that it's important. I mean, it's always hard, but I know I've been in relationships where the person asks something different of me, and I, I change in the way that's easy for me. Mm. And I show up in the way that I can and that I would probably want someone to show up for me, but I haven't taken the time and like really. You think done you've it. addressed the yeah, problem, but right. you haven't. And months later, it's, it's back. And, and it's tough. I don't have enough context. so I can't know if it's that, but I know that I'm guilty of having done that. And so I think it's you need to like look at yourself, see if you've really done what she asked, not just what you thought she asked mm. and do the work. But. I might be very wrong and it might be right to yeah. end it. And, and like, is, I, like I said, you will find happiness at the end of it either way. Even that story that I cited, that friend now is in a new relationship, baby on the way, mm -hmm. a, an awesome match. Like it's, I remember when I first found out that is the previous relationship was ending, I was so distraught and thought like, well, how will there ever be something as beautiful as this again? And guess what? It's as beautiful or more beautiful now. Like, so life mm -hmm. goes on. Yep. You'll be fine. Just make sure you don't wallow for too long. Put yourself out there. Yeah. Um, Take care there's of There's so many possibilities. Of course. Take care of yourself. Yeah. Don't it's, despair. It's not worth dragging out a relationship that's not working. It gives yourself more time to heal and then move on and right. find a relationship where both parties are happy. Speaking of moving on. <laughs> Juan, my wife is pregnant with our first child and is due in three weeks, but we are yet undecided on what to name our son. My wife has settled on one name, but I'm on the fence. I'd like to have a few more options. If you had to pick the coolest okay. name for a baby boy today, what would it be? Wolfgang. Trident. Alistair. <laughs> Otto. Otto von Alistair. Yeah. Um, Shamus. <laughs> there's a catch. His middle name is going to be Eagle. It's a family name. Flying Eagle. Um, Beagle. <laughs> Beagle Mick Eagle. Yeah, yeah. Barry Eagle. So it's Beagle. Like B dot. Eagle. If you had to pick the coolest name for a baby boy today. Yeah. I don't know. McLean. The cool, the, yeah, I'd say McLean. Bobby Wayne. <laughs> uh, anyways, that was from November 10th, so congratulations. You probably have a kid now. Wow. Congratulations. Uh, you, this person, Juan gave us a second. Congratulations <laughs> to your wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you did nothing. Uh, I'd love some general advice from the dads on how you handled the first few weeks with your with your first kids. I'm scared shitless. You well, should be. You're already going through it. I'll pass on some advice that somebody gave to me, which... Um, <laughs> sank in over time and I thought was actually really great which was um, like I was really preoccupied with a lot of the things there's all these like optimal things to have when you're having a kid mm -hmm. like optimally the child will be, will be a vaginal birth and will be breastfed uh, yep. you know so for all these reasons and you'll get a lot of skin to skin and this is the best way Yeah. and this other dad he didn't I didn't give him any of this context or anything he just saw me uh, waiting for the elevator and was like yo whatever works for you guys is perfect for you guys don't worry about any of that other bullshit yep. whatever works is perfect for you uh, unless it's like shaking your baby don't do that don't shake a baby <laughs> <laughs> don't shake a baby that's good advice. I just I just find that like you know when when it, when the baby just won't stop crying I just like smack it until it stops and that works for us you know uh, Jesus don't get overwhelmed with the amount of stuff you can know I don't know. If, uh, there's so much to know, but a lot of it you don't need to know right now. You don't need to know how old is baby or baby like what solid food do I give them first. You don't need to know that for six months, but don't learn that right now. Just worry mm. about the stuff that's relevant now. Yeah, you yeah. don't have to be looking at like you don't need what to, college you're gonna go to right, right now. It, you might have to look at what daycare though. There is depending a, on where you live. There is like a, a, a desire to like look far ahead and be like, okay, we need to have the whole plan and okay, and buy the buy the clothes now. So we're having like laid out and stuff. It's like, yeah, just focus on the now. But I agree. Do you put money in a college fund? That's a good thing. To yeah. Started early. Yeah, yeah. No, sure. Oh, another yeah, thing. Yeah. Speaking I mean, of that, general. speaking of money and and stuff, dude, buy stuff used. Mm. Buy yes. stuff 
used. Your kid, you're going to see. Your kid's going to use things for like two weeks. This clothes, These clothes are going to fit them for a month. You go on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist, all the shit is brand new because everyone else's kid just used it for a month. Mm-hmm. Don't buy new shit. Tell your friends and family to only buy you used stuff. Mm-hmm. It's going to be hard. They're going to be like, well, I thought I was an exception to the rule, so I bought you a new thing. I'm like, no. Tell them to buy you used shit. Pass on your used shit to other people. No. I mean, don't make more crap in this world. Those clothes are just going to end up in a big pile in Africa getting burned. I mean, if they're going to buy you new stuff, it's not your money. It's your earth. It's not my earth. What are you talking about? All right. (laughs) I'm going to Mars. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I don't want to die on this planet. uh, I'd I'd agree with uh, everything uh, James just said. I mean, one thing specifically for us was uh, the breastfeeding thing. And Lauren was like, so because for good reason, the healthcare system, I think both in America and Canada really, really pushes that breastfeeding is the healthiest thing to do for the kid. Mm. And that's true. But at the same time, uh, it's not like the end of the world if you have to switch to formula or start with formula or whatever. Like, uh, there are a number of things like that where the stakes just seem so high. And as you yes. go along, you realize, okay, we- no one's going to die if we just have to, you know, Always switch remember to formula. Or how whatever. many Pop Tarts and, and like craft dinners like, and hot dogs you ate as a kid? Yeah. You'll be fine living yes. on, like, you probably were raised on just sugar. Yes. Yeah. You'll be fine. And, and I mean, especially for the non female member of the relationship, uh, like, have some understanding for what your wife is going through. Uh, because, especially postpartum, those first few weeks can be hell. It can be even worse than the pregnancy. So, uh, mm. have some understanding there. Do your absolute best. Treat her like a queen. Okay. She is a queen. And uh, you said you're sh- scared shitless for the first few weeks. I will say that, like, you're you, still scared, aren't you? You, you hear <laughs> I'm scared in 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 the past uh, of what I went through. Uh, that you hear that it's going to be hard, and it fucking is. It's so so hard. You're going to lose sleep, especially if you are you know helping with the kid waking up in the middle of the night. And then and you stuff. have a second kid, and you're like, how did I think that was hard? Yeah. It was so easy. Right, right, right. So yeah, I just um, have to flex on you. Gear there. up. <laughs> yeah, I only have one kid. I just don't understand. Um, <laughs> gear up for for losing sleep. Uh, but the important thing to know is you will survive. So you find a way. It's hard. It's, it might be the hardest thing you ever do in your life, but you'll find a way. Uh, just stay strong. Life always finds a way. Yeah. You find the strength. It's like the, it's like the mom, uh, mom, mama bear picking up the car. Wait, mom mm. screwed up those. Yep. Uh, Captain <laughs> Chunderpants. Captain Chunderpants says, Honestly, I'm really lucky. Good, stable job. <laughs> Honestly, enjoy doing my job. Good pay, good benefits. My wife and I have been together for a long time, and we have a good relationship. That's it. Great. Thanks no, for writing. No, there's more. There's more. <laughs> my persistent dread is that my mother died suddenly and unexpectedly when I was 16, and it screwed me up for 15 years. Bad grades, bad relationships, lots of self-hate, etc. My wife is giving birth to our first child on Saturday, induced, uh, and this is in the past, so congratulations. Um, and I'm terrified that... Even though I do see a counselor that some days I feel incapable of taking care of myself. So how am I going to take care of a human completely dependent on my wife and I? It's a good thing your wife's there. Uh, (laughs) Just joking. Uh, Riley and James, I know you have some good experience with kids. Uh, Yeah, we have bad experiences with kids too. Uh, But anyone else can also speak on this. I think this is like broadly applicable. What do you guys think? Everybody is going to screw up their kids somehow. You're going to screw them up. Have you guys had the experience of like you be shitty and, and then you go oh my god i am my father or i am my mother i am all the time like the yeah. worst the things all that the you time. do when you're at your worst is like exactly your parents you're like oh <laughs> sauce, um, the worst yeah those things are going to happen i mean the important thing to recognize is a uh y- you know no one is perfect everyone every parent uh having a kid for the first time is having it for the first time and you're gonna have to figure stuff out and you're gonna screw it up and your kids are going to have horrible memories of the time that you screwed it up the important thing is what you do after that okay you made a mistake now what like you obviously want to do the best that you can to not make mistakes but they're gonna happen so the stress of like being terrified that you're gonna like screw up your kid in the same way that uh you were screwed up by your experiences like you know that's a rational fear to have i'll say you know because like that does happen Mm. but at the same time 
Recognize that it's rational, so you're not you're not crazy because you're thinking about this. Recognize that there are things that you can do to mitigate whatever mistakes that you may make. Like be there, like as long as you, uh, it's important to you that you are in your child's life and you are thinking about these things, the very fact that you're thinking about it and trying to be a good dad is going to make you a better dad or whatever than a mother, whoever, than someone who is not thinking about that and is just kind of like flying around. You're going to be flying around, but don't worry so much about it. Just do your best is really what I don't know the details of your mother's death. That's true. Um, but odds are, odds are that it was um, beyond anyone's control. And so the same thing had happened to any one of us, mm. including yourself, right? We could just get hit by a bus and then our kids would be left with the you know, one parent or no parents uh, and whoever you have in your surroundings, your, your like grandparents or whatever. Um, and that's awful. And that would screw up anybody. And there's nothing you can do to change that. Mm. That could happen. You get struck by lightning. All you can do is try to make the best memories every day. So that if that does happen to you, that's how you remember that. Like that your legacy and what your children remember of you is is what is what you left them with. It's what you put forward. So use that as incentive. It takes effort to be a really great parent and put that effort in. It takes effort to like make a fort with your kids or, you know, to put your phone down and just like put on, have a tea party or whatever. Yeah. I mean, and one thing I want to uh, what, like addendum is that one thing he said specifically, they said is, uh, I feel sometimes I feel incapable of taking care of myself. So how am I going to take care of a human completely dependent on my wife and I? Yes, that's that's, that's the feeling. Everyone <laughs> feels that. Every parent feels that. Uh, when you get to the moment, you somehow uh, just just do. Or you dump it on your partner. Yeah, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> yeah, don't no. do that. Okay, you are your biggest critic, but you're also your biggest supporter. Mm. So take the time to prove to yourself, even though it sounds and feels impossible, take the time to prove to yourself and prove to your wife and your child that you are capable. Even if, like we said prior to, even if that's one step, one day at a time, like just don't, don't be so hard on yourself, but. Mm. <laughs> or even if it's one thing, if it's yeah. like, I make the bottles. I'm great at mixing the formula and I can just do that. Exactly. You know, just take it from there. Identify, yeah. I mean, that'd be like working with your partner to identify like division of labor, like who does what, like figuring out, oh, this, there's a there's an opening here. I can fill that in, you know? Do what works for right. you and yeah. your family. I feel like uh, I kind of identify with what James is saying. Is like if, if you are, you lost your mom suddenly, I, that fear would be real. I, I've, I have been with people that they have this huge fear of death and every day it can cripple them if they let it. But I think the best advice that I've ever seen given was like, use that fear to make decisions to live your life in a way that fulfills you. And it's like, mm -hmm. live, you like treat your kids like not this could be the last day you ever see them, but like that each interaction is meaningful. That it's not just like, I'm tired from work. I don't feel like dealing with this, like, sorry, dumping on my partner. It's like, no, like this this is meaningful. This time is important. Like you'll never get this minute back. And you'll once you have kids, that's what back. you're living for now anyway. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. I think that's, that's something, there's a switch that flips once you have the kid and suddenly you realize that suddenly you view them as like even more important than yourself. And so like, you're like, I'm tired. I'm hungry. I haven't done my things that I need to do, but this kid needs to eat and this kid's needs to go to sleep and blah, blah, blah. And so you, and he needs to have a bath. So you, you do end up prioritizing that just like subconsciously. I never mm -hmm. shared food before <laughs> ever. <laughs> and then now I'll be like, that's a line I would take, never cross. <laughs> take my only meat. Like yeah, just, yeah. I will go without, I will eat crackers today. Yeah. <laughs> this one's a fun one. Winston says, I play, it's not really Winston, but it's fun to say this. Uh, Win Winston says, I play guitar in a garage band and we're in the stage of writing a lot of songs. The other guitar player in our group has written the majority of the songs. I am writing a song that we think is a banger. It's always the first thing we work on at practice and we've been putting off everything else until we finish this song. It's a song that's very close to me. However, the other guitar player keeps adding parts of the song that I really <laughs> don't vibe with. This is great. I don't want to be a steamroller that shoots down every idea that I don't like. I want the music we make to be the result of a collaborative process. I also don't want this song to be set in stone while having parts that I cringe at while playing or listening to them. Sometimes I feel insecure about voicing these negative opinions because I respect the other guitarist as a musician and a friend. 
How do you guys compromise when you have the insecurity of voicing dissenting opinions? Fuck, this is tough. This is a a tough tough one one for sure. Who's been in a band? I mean, oh, I didn't know we were doing, (laughs) I thought we were just talk. Yeah. Uh, We've been, almost everyone raised their hands. I haven't been in a, we didn't do a lot of originals that we mostly a cover band Mm. that I was in. I was in a band that did original songs, so I can kind of uh, vibe with this. Uh, that's really, really tough. Like the, the, the core thing about being in a band writing original music is, uh, the fact that it's a collaboration. So you might feel that you don't like it. Uh, I felt that way about some of the stuff that we played, but at the same time, you are in a band and you kind of sign up, up to do this in collaboration with other people. So there isn't, there's, there's one element where you kind of have to just accept that that's what they're doing. But there's also a part of it where, you know, if you think that it is actually making the song worse, you know, that's something that you guys have to talk about as a, as a band. Like you can't just like, I wouldn't talk directly to the guitarist. I would talk to a couple of the other guys and say, is this bothering all of us? Let's just say in the band meeting. I mean, like it depends on what kind of band you are. If you're like, you know, this is like a young person thing and you're just kind of like chilling and, and. And, yeah, uh, like what and stage are you band. at? Yeah, and if you're older, obviously this this would be more of like a professional situation where you, it's like an actual problem you guys all have to solve. But whatever but it is, it could it could be the thing that keeps us from breaking through. Right. Regardless, you need to. It needs to be a collective process because you're a band and you're not just like unless you're, you're not just like you don't get to dictate uh, who what licks the guitar guy can do. Right. Fortunately, though, Winston said that that they respect this other person as a musician so to me that says that other guitarist isn't like bad because i've i've had been around bands before where like there's someone who's just like obviously worse and they don't know they're the worst yeah and then like every they just make every fucking song worse and you're like we need to get this person out of the band it doesn't sound like this person's that it sounds like this person is a, is a strong a strong force in the band writes most of the songs is probably very talented so it, to me that means that Though you might not think that their parts are good fits for your song oh, here. Oh, that's another aspect. That could be yeah, totally yeah, subjective. Mm-hmm. It could be that you should just ask around. And I think just ask the band, hey, we have these two competing like parts that could go here. Do you guys like what they're doing? Do you like this option? What do you think is better? You could record it and, and ask friends. Because maybe that's it's just like it doesn't fit the idea that you had for the song. But to other people who are not in your mind, they think it works great. Well, yeah. it's a part of the challenge of a collaborative process is sometimes you have a clear idea of where you want to take it and someone's really good idea doesn't fit with that. And either like you need to stick with yours and like shield away from that and stay focused on that or their idea is better and like you maybe need to move it. Mm-hmm. But I also think practically what I would discuss is like, hey, maybe these things, these licks you've written, these like these verses you've you've done that works better for another song. Let's break it off, split them into two different songs. And then we can mm. develop that one because I really like these parts of it. Yeah. And then we can take this and kind of take it more the direction that I wanted. Yet another option is to instead of don't tell them what to play and don't just like shoot down what they've done, but maybe just bring them in on. You said the song's really close to you. Bring them in on what that, that mm. vision is and let let them in their way uh, create something for that vision so go hey like uh what you're doing is cool but i always thought this song was kind of more nostalgic or had more of a you know it had this emotion to it and i don't think what you're playing right now really conveys that emotion can you show me what you could do if you're if you're channeling that Mm -hmm. and then so then they still get to have their creative agency in the collaborative process that is the band and then they give you something else and Mm -hmm. and you go yeah that's warmer that's warmer. That's closer to what I'm going for. Do that even more, or like, and then you could give like specific, like go to a minor at this part or whatever. Yeah, and I think yeah. I I think that this can apply broadly to any kind of creative uh, endeavor. Yeah, uh, I think that one thing that I've learned to accept a bit more is the fact that like people, when you're collaborating with people on something creative, uh, you're going to have an idea about how it should go, and someone else is going to have a different idea, and you know, sometimes they're wrong and you have to be like, no, we're doing this because this is the vision. But other times uh, you might like have some like pushback on something. You might feel some like pushback for something that someone else did because you're like, that's not what I was thinking. But it's so much better to allow uh, collaboration and to allow other people to have input, even on things that are kind of like your baby. Like I'm thinking of Tech Longer, where 
you know, it was something that I really, 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 really cared about. And I had a really tight vision in my mind of what it would be. I gave it to, you know, Alex uh, Poitvin, uh, one of our editors, and he did a lot of things that I just did not uh, expect, at least. Yeah. And some of them, I'm like, I didn't see this coming and you freaking knocked it out of the park. You added something that I never would have thought to add and it's so much greater. There are other things they did where I was like, I don't know about this. Uh, no, let's change it or whatever. But even in that process, we kind of talked about it and we could only talk about that and come to something that we were both happy with because we because I brought it up. I brought it up that I didn't really love that and he's pushed back a little bit and then we end up with something that's even better than both of us were thinking about. Yeah, so and this is that can I, happen. It seems like this is one of your first contributions and the other person's written a ton of songs so i think that you have a little more leeway you got a little more grace in the bank where you can go hey this is, i'm not used to this this is my first uh can we just do it my way or can we you know like i don't think you have to be that um can so concerned and with the knocking down this guy's ideas until it's like a pattern where it's like every time they do one of yeah. your songs it's your way or the highway yeah. Try not to think of it. Well, okay, it, it it is your song, and but it's it's really tough. It's really tough. But you'll be uh, you'll be better off if you can think of it as, okay, you had this idea for a song, and instead of it being your song, it's now your idea uh, turned into all of your collective the band song. song. Yeah, the band song. A band is yeah. like you said, collaborative. So yeah. it's not just one person's piece of artwork. It's everybody's con con contribution to that piece of artwork. So mm -hmm. I definitely have experienced that like throughout group projects in mm -hmm. school and stuff, especially because design is very like right. subjective or yeah. objective or whatever. So and a lot of people have strong opinions. Lots of arguing, <laughs> even uh, down to typefaces. Like, do you want a serif or a sans serif? And there's lots of battles around that. But it's a matter of uh, coming to um, compromise yeah. and figuring out what works best for in, everyone. In art, nothing's objectively right or wrong or good or bad. It's just like, well, if we've decided that we're trying to convey this message or intention, yeah. what is going to best convey that? Totally. Yeah. There's a few auteurs out there who should be given full free reign to do uh, to have full control over something, but they are rare. Everyone else is better off this if they guy. collaborate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. there's one more that we didn't read, but it's another like, should I go get should I get back on the horse and date again? And I think we pretty much spoke to that. Yeah. Um, so why don't we jump into fan service? Ooh. I have to resist resist the urge to because like <laughs> sometimes you got to just let it play. Yeah, sometimes you got to do the blah 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 though too. So last week we did Wakanda Forever, and um, one thing that we didn't really speak to or realize, I guess, or I don't know, talk about was the representation of Latinos in that movie. And I saw a couple comments about it, and I wanted to read out one of them if I could just get this damn image to fit <laughs> my freaking screen. It's okay. So small. I'll hold it up. <laughs> so I very rarely comment on videos, but I felt like I had a couple of things to say here because I'm mixing myself and I've been following this for a while. So while yes, the movie was pretty average, there's lots of love for this movie because of the representation of the Latino and indigenous cast and characters. Tenoch Huerta was probably the best actor they could have chosen for this role uh, for uh, Namor. He's an activist who often speaks about the pseudo caste system that exists in Latin America due to colorism and the overwhelming overwhelmingly overwhelming amount of white Mexicans in Mexican media media. He says in one interview that if Mexico was seen only through the eyes of the media, people would think it was a Scandinavian country. Besides that, seeing representation in the indigenous cast and seeing them visit a small indigenous village in Yucatan, Mexico was amazing. On top of that, Namor's origin is directly tied to the colorization of Latin America by Spain and the generational trauma that comes with that. So yeah, those are awesome points. Um, thank you for that. Obviously we can't really speak to that. Um, but um, thank you. Mm. He also did you say the bit about it's not being our fault? Because I just really want to make sure that that's out there. What do you mean? <laughs> he, he he left a left a reply to his own comment. Also, you guys not understanding or relating to some of these aspects is not your fault. I still enjoyed the podcast, <laughs> but I wish you guys would have mentioned that. That's fair. Um, yeah, and that's that's totally fair. I feel like um, obviously you know I we. I thought that we did a pretty good job of just like pointing those out because I thought that like like I said this is really cool they get mm -hmm. representation and I I loved the depiction of the uh, uh oh I forget Talokans um, as 
as that culture and not like the more Greek based Atlantean yeah. culture that is in the comics. I think that was a really, really cool interpretation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that's awesome that they were able to get uh, representation. Um, yeah, that's it. Super Saiyan Kane. Thank you. Do uh, you guys have any other fan services? Joel Sidler said your uh, David's pronunciation of whatever words is a lovable quirk. Thank you. Okay. I like that. So, and I agree. There's six quirks. There's up, down, top, bottom, strange, and charm. And oh, yours is, this is charm. Oh, charm quirk. Okay, <laughs> all right. physics humor for you. That's a good joke. Um, yeah, no, that's, well, thanks for bringing that's all I got. How about now playing? Anything else? Do you I have, do. Hit the button. <gasps> Hello. <laughs> uh, I finished God of War, but I won't talk about that this week because uh, I'll oh. let people have more time to oh. play it. Oh, okay. It's, like, it's a long game. You didn't fill your cup this weekend. You played God of War. Yeah. <laughs> I finished it Friday. Uh, I have strong thoughts. Um, but I did watch Spirited, which is the Apple TV Christmas movie with Ryan Reynolds and <laughs> Will Ferrell. Oh, yeah. It was quite good. That looked interesting. It, it's much better than I thought. It's... Uh, it's a musical, which I think they didn't do a good job conveying. Uh, it's, In the marketing. Yeah. And it's one of those musicals that has, you know, the kind of music that's enjoyable enough while it's happening. And then as soon as the song's done, you're like, what was that song again? Mm. Um, but the the charm of the movie, it nails that perfect like Christmas movie you know, optimism, but a little bit of cynicism that works in the modern age. Because you can't have it like, you know, pure optimism, but it's never like mean spirited and I thought they nailed it. It was like a 7.5 the whole movie, which is surprised really high for a Christmas movie. Hmm. But then they tried to do this like subversion thing. Cause the, the Chris, there's basically like a play on Christmas is this spoilers Carol. now. Yeah, we'll do spoilers. So the, the movie is a play on the Christmas Carol, um, where the, instead of it being like just the Christmas Carol, we're seeing behind the scenes of, the haunts and every year they they choose someone and they do the Christmas Carol haunt on these people that help change them and they're trying to change one person a year or whatever and so this year Will Ferrell is like the he's the ghost of Christmas oh so pre- it's the perspective of the ghost it's the perspective of the ghost oh cool um, he's the ghost of Christmas present and he's you know he's been doing it for 200 years or whatever and he's everyone wants him to retire and go to earth but he's like kind of like not sure or whatever uh, and he finds Ryan Reynolds who's this big media influencer he he like he's like a consultant he's a media consultant who kind of works with companies behind the scenes and when they start working those angles of like how he uses outrage to control people it's like really interesting and then it backs off from that and i was like okay that's not interesting but basically my big problem with the movie because it's good 7.5 all the way up to the end is they try and subvert the ending where the whole way he's like i'm not a good person i'm not going to change i'm not going to do this and they do a really good job of like playing with how it's the dynamics are going and i thought it was really successful and like not being like twists and turns but the character drama that are happening is constantly satisfying and surprising uh in the the perfect way but at the end will ferrell is about to get hit by a bus um and he pushes him out of the way or whatever and so he like sacrifices himself to save Will Ferrell and then time stops. And then there's when they when the person changes, like everyone comes in and they sing a song because it's like, yay, the person changed. <laughs> and they do that. They sing the song and then the the bus hits him and kills him. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a great moment of like, oh, excuse me, what the fuck? Uh, and then the the head of the ghost is like, sorry, Ryan Reynolds, like like this sacrifice wouldn't mean anything if there wasn't a price to pay. And I'm like, OK, this is kind of interesting, mm. but. It's the last Jedi of Christmas movies. Sure. <laughs> but the problem is, is that the sin that Ryan Reynolds is really atoning for is that his sister, who was dying in the hospital, asked him to take care of her daughter. And he said Oof. no. And he like shirked duty and made his brother take care of the kid. <laughs> and it's like really bad. And there's a scene and like that's like the crux, emotional crux of him changing. And it's like mm-hmm. the, you see it early in the movie. and He's like, I'm not doing this. And he runs away. And then later when he's grown a bit, they, he has to face it. And he does. But at the end of the movie, he doesn't have to make amends for it. He dies oh. and he becomes the fucking ghost of Christmas present. That's like the like end of the movie, which is cute or whatever. Uh-huh. But he never talks to the fucking kid again. And then it's never like, I want to take care of you. And I want right. to haunt you. Haunt, yeah, sure. Haunt <laughs> you. And I think that the movie is really this is suffers because they thought, they thought that the ending of him becoming the ghost of Christmas present was a cute ending and that they sacrificed this emotional crux, which I think is really strong. And it totally brought the movie down to like a 5.5. Wow. For me. Yes. My, my question is who's taking care of the kid now then? Uh, the, the other bro- brother. The, the other brother yeah. who was taking care of him. He was like a bit of a doofus. Um, um, but 
it's such a bummer. Like he should have had to like be a better person. Yeah. I hate, I hate, I'm just it's my so, angry. It's so mm. weird when movies like set up something like that and you're like, okay, but then they just don't pay, like they, they, they don't manage to pay it off when, when uh, to us in hindsight, yeah. the, the way to pay that off is so obvious. Yeah. It's uh the, he, he addresses her in the sense that early on in the movie, he's, so he's like a media guy. He helps politicians win. She comes to him. She wants to run for class president and he gives her the advice. He gets this person to go and find dirt on the kid she's running against. Mm, go dark. <laughs> and so he finds the dirt and then the like in his ghost visions, the kid, she, she releases the dirt and the kid will like in a few weeks kill himself. Damn, that's a dark movie. And so he like at the climax of the movie, he like runs to stop her from doing it. But she has chosen not to do it. She's a better person than him. Uh, and so, like, at that moment, he's like, oh, I'm so proud of you. I'm so glad. But that's the end of their interaction. Mm. And even at the end of the movie, he sees Will Ferrell and Will Ferrell tells her, tells him that she's got into Harvard. And I'm like, you're not at all involved in your yeah. fucking. The kid. doofus was the right choice. Yeah, I was so mad. And I was like, ah, oh, that would have been such a better. They needed to handle that emotional yeah. through line to the end. I love how like how visceral like storytelling is. And you're just like when a story is wrong, we yeah. don't all really know what the right elements of bad elements of a story are. But like and we can intuit them. Like, yeah. Maybe you can't write your own story, but you just know when a story is not doing its job. Yeah. Mm. It's like baked in or yep. millennia. I, I, what are you watching? <laughs> uh, I recently finished the first season of White Lotus. Have any of you oh! watched it? My wife watched it. I watched a couple episodes. Hell oh, yeah. yeah. It's really good. White like, Lotus is one of the best shows I've ever watched. It's so good, right? It's so amazing. I, I was like watching it with Jake and he was so bored of it the first like two or three episodes. So he's like, I'm going to go play COD. Classic You Jake. watched the, the movie. And then like yesterday I had to explain what happened to him. And I was like, how do I fit this all in? Because the last two episodes are a fucking roller coaster. Yes. But there's, it's so good. And I've just started the second season now. Nice. So. I really it like is, the tone of that show. It is yeah. scathing. It is like uh, up to date on the cultural moment. Totally. Uh, and it... Like it, it. I love that the show, uh, kind of its like core structure is basically having all these uh, very different characters and putting them together into different situations so that they can explore some like philosophical or cultural idea. Yeah. They basically just kind of get into like internet arguments where it's like, Dad, you can't say that. Why not? <laughs> because it's like, it's uh, it's not PC, and it's like, well, I don't have to be woke and blah blah blah. Wait, it's wait, like, wait, wait. This is this the show where it's like. Some people committing crimes in Thailand and stuff. What? No. no. Oh man, I totally thought this. What, what was that? I, uh, sorry, <laughs> I haven't this seen this like, at all. It's then. like the hotel in Hawaii, right? Yes. Yeah, it's a it's a resort called resort. the White Lotus, and uh, yeah, it's just following like a bunch of guests at the resort. Uh, it's it, sort of anthology format, right? This no, not in the not within the season. So oh. season two is out, and uh, Lauren and I are watching that right now. Uh, it's actually like I expected the season two to be worse it's very so similar far, in it's tone great. yeah, yeah. Great. Have, you, have you watched season i've two? started okay. i'm on episode two at nice. this point but like yeah i think the show just does a really good job of balancing like the psychological aspect of it there's some like satirical aspects mm -hmm. which are really fun so the whole time you're kind of like just enjoying watching these people go through their time at the resort and all these things that are happening. And then there's so many times where something completely unexpected happens and yeah. you're like, well, I want to know what happens next. I want to mm. know what happens next. It's like a perfect mix of, of, uh, cultural and philosophical analysis, a uh, comedy of errors, a, uh, like a murder mystery. Uh, there's all these elements and it, it, uh, it's, it's perfect. I, I was thinking the of the serpent. Which I think I was watching when you were watching White Lotus. Like oh, okay. Cross. I watched Mandy, finally. Oh, nice. oh Did you enjoy with it? With Nicolas so Cage. Good. I, uh, oh, man, was I ever enhanced. And that's a, <laughs> that's a good movie to be enhanced <laughs> it, for. You need it. It's, yeah. The first hour. This movie has so much art put into it that just doesn't even need to be there. It's just, it's so artful. It does so many cool things. Uh, I thought the first hour was amazing. And the second hour was like more straightforward. Mm -hmm. it, like, I like it was, some of the weird temple stuff at the end. Like when he's like... Go, like at their the, the the hole and shit. No spoilers. Oh, I kind of remember this. I, I like I like I the end end, but I agree. Like the last forty five, the first forty five minutes of the last hour. Not into it. It was a great movie. Mm. I uh, recommend it. It's um. I understand now why. Like every time I asked 
people like what's Mandy about no one would like say <laughs> I was just gonna ask you yeah. I was just gonna ask you could you give a quick uh, it's basically description a, I, all I can say is it's a psychedelic movie where a couple gets attacked by a cult okay no yep. no yep. but yeah led by Mandy no no Mandy is his partner spoilers <laughs> what the heck there's no spoilers but I Mandy's remember... not a cult person he's one of the couples uh, not Oh, oh you go. go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I just remember like not enjoying Nicolas Cage movies. And then the person I was with at the time was like, okay, but we're going to watch Mandy. And we watched it. And I think that kind of reintroduced my, uh, mm. my, I get you cage for, yeah, yeah. for Nicolas Cage movies. Um, my only now playing contribution is that I finished Anthem, the game. I think you say Andor again. I was like, oh no, God. I, no. I have to say, have I'm, you watched Andor? I'm five episodes into Andor. Okay, wait, oh, before no. that, before that, the I, finished, I finished Anthem. It's it's a Bioware game. It it was it was hyped up when, in 2019 or whatever when it was coming out. I was like so stoked about it because the music and everything was so good. Uh, I just wanted to play through the game. It made it hard because it's an MMO and it like there are points where it just like stops the story because you have to do like a side mission or whatever, and that's stupid. I understand completely why it failed, but I'm really sad that it failed. The story was lackluster. I mm. expected something, but like. It is a story and you can play it to completion and you beat the bad guy, but like it was so unsatisfying and I was like, I thank goodness that I only spent I mean, it was like a it was like a twelve hour campaign or something. Okay, yeah. Like thank goodness that it was this short because uh, there is a reason why people were like the fall of Bioware is happening. It's already happened. Movie. Yeah. yeah. The, ever, for me, Inqui- Inquisition was the f- first like Oh, things aren't quite right. Yeah. Then, Bioware? <laughs> <laughs> uh, where Inquisition, Dragon Age Inquisition was still pretty good, but it was like, there's there's like a bunch of filler, and yeah. the story is kind of like, uh, yeah. and then they, they did the EA thing of having the real ending hidden behind DLC. So the game <sighs> ends, but then there's like a whole, there's like the kind real of, ending is It kind of alludes to on. something in this one. Like yeah. it ends and they're like, oh, we just found this guy. And it's mm-hmm. like, okay, so you want me to play like into the end game to like play to get the real ending or whatever. Um, but one, uh, one la- last thing about Anthem is just how much of a tragedy it is that like the gameplay is super, super cool. Your Iron Man, the world is super, super interesting. I mean, like they created so much lore for this. And as I'm playing through, it's kind of like, it was kind of like reading like an ancient a tome that's cool as if like there was this whole world where people spent so long like writing the dialogue and writing all the background and coming up with creatures and physics for how things work and blah blah and they just never wrote a and main just, story and now it's just gone it's just dead no one's ever going to touch this franchise ever again because it's just toxic and it's just so sad to me do you know why it didn't sell it should have been called and him okay one of the things that <laughs> You know, instead of calling it, acknowledge my joke. It was one of the things that was one of the things that was so the name was so attractive to me because, like, the core uh, idea there is the anthem of creation. That's it's sort cool. of like the force, but it's like music based, and so it's like Lord of the Rings kind of like vibes there, where mm-hmm. the world is created through song. That's cool. And like, there's so many aspects there that was so cool. Anyways. I'm done with Anthem. You had a you had a missed opportunity when you described Anthem as toxic. You could have described it as Ananthema. Uh, that would have been good. An- anathema. Ananthema. Um, okay. Yeah. But thank you so much for watching. I'm Andor. into it. It's good. Five we'll we'll have a proper we'll have a proper discussion when I get to the end. Yes. Uh, it is season def- finale. Uh, well, How many episodes is there? Ten. When this episode comes out, the finale will have already happened. Oh, I'll watch it all by next Wednesday. Week then. Yeah. I'm into it. It's by far the best Star Wars show easy not not even close i don't think it's like a 10 out of 10 but it's like it it doesn't rely on the iconography in the way that is so fucking exhausting with yes. star wars where it's like oh you like you like these characters you like stormtroopers yeah, yeah. it's just like it's a good story with a cool universe and like i kind of forget that it's star wars in some ways and it's just like you enjoy it and like you like characters i think it's so far not a ton has happened but it's good it's almost like i love it and it's frustrating because I'm just like, why couldn't this have been what we got instead of like the Force Awakens? It's because like, that they they were relying on that iconography. I know, I know, but it's like it's almost it's Member so berries. annoying because yeah. now Disney and uh, the people, the creative people behind Lucasfilm, are realizing that like, wait, people will really like if we make a good show and like make something that's good. And like it does, I think there are stormtroopers in two episodes. T- 
tops. Oh, well, yeah, there's, like, there's an there's empire base. Sand and troopers, stuff, yeah. but like other than that, there's no recognizable ships really no until Jedi. until later. Yeah. Uh, there's there's no bounty hunters. There's no Jedi. There's no. Sith. It's just like Star Wars wardrobe. It's like if, if even it's pretty cyber. No, it's honestly it's like a it's like a down to earth or <laughs> whatever uh, Alderaan uh, a depiction of a story set in the Star Wars universe. The tools that they use are accurate. The technology is there. The you feel as if you are witnessing the early days of the rebellion in the days of the Empire, and it's just like everything is top notch. Yep. It's just so. I, I don't even I repeat I end up repeating myself about this show because it's just like I can't I can't do it. When it's probably too diverse though. Hey, <laughs> it's too woke. No, it's that's another plus for it. Honestly, is that they have all this diverse casting and it works so great. Well, I, there's question, a there's a lesbian couple in it. Oh my god. Question for you: uh, Are the flashbacks on that like on his origin planet? Are they supposed to have subtitles or is it supposed to be just like going by kind of like movements and stuff? Because when I when they're speaking in their native tongue. I don't get subtitles. You have Disney Plus. What do you mean you don't get subtitles? When they're oh, um, what's it called? Caracas. Yeah, no, I didn't ca- have no, I didn't have subtitles there okay. either, and I think it's just because it's, it's like, just supposed to be. Yeah, it's kind of clear. They're, what they're like doing. a, they're like a indigenous, yeah, tribe, of. and let us out of here. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> but <laughs> but we'll talk about it more next. Star Wars. I just wanted to say that that doesn't have stormtroopers and doesn't have X wings. Blah blah blah. But there are actually a ton of like references like deep for like hardcore. Saying, right? Yeah. For hardcore star Wars guys, if people, if you're watching in the background and stuff, there's lots of references to things. Uh, so it's not just in your face. Okay. That's it. Uh, b- bye bye. Love you <laughs> next week. <laughs> South park. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. South park. The, what's it called? Bigger, Bigger longer, longer and uncut. uncut. Oh, it's a circumcision God. joke. <laughs> they are funny. Those guys are funny. Cosmos, big fat bitches, big fat bitch. I have a whole wild world. Yeah. It's, 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 it's gonna be good. I guess I go. I'm my favorite character. I can't wait to hear what Cartman has to say. Yeah. <gasps> what would Brian Boitano do? It's gonna be a good one. I'm excited. I can't I wait for the joke. Open your heart, Riley. Open your. I watch Andor. If I'm being completely honest, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be hard to open my heart. I believe. Really? But you're gonna love this movie. What? South Park? Yeah. I guess we'll find out next week. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm doing it. <laughs> fine. <laughs> All right. Tweet at us at TJM Pod. Email us hello there just movies.com. Oh. Bye. Goodbye. I love, love you. Bye.